Hello, friends. We are so glad you made it here for episode two. And we thank you for all the tremendous feedback on not only what we talked about in episode one, but that there was an episode one and now a two and more to come here on Syracuse Sports. One thing that I am really looking forward to is you being a part of this show. Now, I'm easy to get a hold of, right? You can find me on Twitter, Brent Axe Media, and a lot of you do that. You can send me an email, bax at syracuse.com. But one fun way we're going to incorporate your opinions and your thoughts and questions and feedback here into Syracuse Sports is we have a voicemail line and we want to hear from you. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen if you're watching on YouTube. It's in the show notes if you're listening on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you're listening today. But it's 315-552-1964. Put that in your phone and anytime you want to fire off a voicemail to me, We'll incorporate them into the show. You're watching a game. You got to give me a take. Send me a voicemail. You think of a question in the middle of the night about Dino Baber's status as head coach of the Orange, as we're going to discuss today on episode two, fire off a voicemail. So for those of you that were radio listeners, this is a cool way to still get your voice heard on the show. So send us a voicemail, 315-552-1964. Well, we didn't want to wait too long until we talked about the question on everybody's mind when it comes to Syracuse football in 2023, and that is if Dino Babers will be coaching Syracuse football in 2024. My Syracuse.com colleague, Emily Liker, and I discussed the important questions with that, and if Dino is going to get to 2024, there are certain players that cannot get hurt on this football team. So Emily and I rank the five most indispensable players for Syracuse football in 2023. Let's stick around for one more thing, as I'll expand a little bit more on Dino Babers and a little theory I have about his job status here at Syracuse football. Let's get to it, shall we? Hello, Emily Liker. Hello, Brent X. How are you? <laughs> Good. How are you? Thanks for hopping on uh, the the second voyage of uh, Syracuse sports here. I know this is my, my third appearance on this That's little right. podcast. We've got starting up here. That's right. You have become like, you know, who was like a frequent, like letterman guest or something. I'm trying to think of you. You're, you're, that you're that guest so far in the young history of this podcast. We just can't get enough of you. It's fantastic. I'd like to think it's more than just the fact that it's football season that I get to it's join you. as often as I do. It's you. The football helps too, though. But so we are, of course, uh, right here in the heart of football training camp, getting closer to the start of the season. And we're covering that. And we're talking about that. And Emily's writing about that. So you should read it. But the question that kind of hovers around this season is the status of Dino Babers. Now he did a lot last year to maybe cool off some of the hot seat by getting to a bowl game, but he's in such an interesting scenario, Emily, because we think his contract is over at the end of next season. We don't know that for sure. We're pretty sure about that because Syracuse doesn't exactly say here, take a look at the contract, right? As a private school. So this is an interesting decision that John Wildhack and Kent Severud and whoever else you want to put on that list is going to have to make Mm -hmm. about Dino because do you have a coach get extended if they make a bowl game? Do you bring them back, but don't extend them because that's to me a big boo-boo. You can't have a coach next year out there recruiting, trying to bring in transfers, trying to do his thing. And nobody knows what his status is beyond next season, right? If they don't get to a certain threshold, six wins, bowl game, whatever the case may be, do you cut the cord? It's a fascinating scenario, so let's dive in here, shall we? Okay, so let me just start with this. Should they have extended him after they got to a bowl game last year? Would that have been the the easiest thing to do from from all standpoints? No, I don't think so. You don't think so? I I just think in this day and age – one, like a bowl game is can't be the basis for like a successful season anymore. Like 0.500 cannot be the record you are aiming towards. And I think that's even more true when you're looking at a coach that has been somewhere more than five years. Look, within your first five years of coaching, I, I'll give you a little leeway. Like mm-hmm. you, you have some room to make some mistakes, to have a couple losing seasons in there consecutively in that first five years that you're there. You start reaching towards 10 years – And it's like six and six is what you're happy about at the end of a year. Like obviously last year they finished seven and five. So it was a little in the regular season and then dropped the bowl game. So seven and six, but I just, I I think it was smart that they did not throw another year on 
obviously, like you said, we don't know exactly when this contract ends, which we know is an extension from 2018, which was the last time they had a really significant winning season, their 10 and three year. Um, Dino confirmed that to me at, at ACC kickoff without really confirming it. Cause I was like, have you been extended? And he was like, let's put it this way. You would know if I had been <laughs> extended, which is about the best we will get because John Wildhack certainly did not give us that straightforward no. of an answer no. uh, when we talked to him earlier this summer. So yeah, I, I, I think it was smart for them to not extend him. Like I think if he had had one year left on his contract last year, maybe then it would have been enough to be like, okay, we're going to throw you another year, extend you through 2024. But he had, he had two seasons left at the end of 2022. I agree. But Mm. even with everything you just said about your approaching 10 years, six wins can't be the standard. You know, we got to think bigger here. They make a bowl game this year. I think you have to extend him. Now, I don't think you have to extend him till like the year 2040. Okay. (laughs) But I don't think under any circumstances, if this team makes a bowl game, that you can have a coach hanging in the wind in 2024, right? And just have the possibility of recruits or transfers. Now, transfers in some cases would only be here for one or two years. When they, you cannot have your head coach or any assistant coaches out there put in the position of, well, how long is Dino going to be here? Well, kid, let me tell you, we don't know. As opposed to, oh, didn't you see? We just signed our coach to a contract extension. So I think while I agree with you that the standard should be a little higher and Syracuse fans are certainly yearning for that, they get that six win plateau. I'm not even saying I keep hoping on six wins because that's the standard. Mm -hmm. They make a bowl game. No matter what the wins are, I think John has to sit down and a two-year extension. And here's the advantage that he has, frankly, Emily. He can extend Dino Babers and not tell any of us. Right, he can, <laughs> or he can extend Dino, and it'll be the shortest uh, press release in history. We've extended Coach Babers. Details of this will not be released, so <laughs> at the very least, it's out there. So, I think bowl game equals extension. To play a little devil's advocate in in your argument that how are you going to promise to recruits and stuff like right. that if he's yeah. only around for one year? So I I tried to use that kind of phrasing to get like a more precise answer out of. Dino, when I when I chatted with him at kickoff, and I was like, with how your contract stands right now, can you promise the class of 2024 that you're going to be here for a predominant part of their college careers? Yeah. And the gist of what he said was like, I could promise something, but you can't really promise anything, meaning that you can get fired or get let yeah. go at any moment. Yeah. So like, I think regardless of like the contract status, I mean... He, Like, even if they did extend him, they could still decide to fire him after the 2024 season. So I don't know how much of an argument that really is to needing to extend him after this season if they make a bowl game. Okay, so maybe there's a difference between that conversation and this one. What is enough to bring him back for 2024, with or without the extension? What's the line? Because I think the line is a bowl game, right? If you're going to draw a line somewhere, I don't think you can put – seven and five in this bowl game. I just think bowl games, the standard, right? And I brought this up in the monologue to start the show. The theory that you have to be seven and five to get extended six wins to come back next year with no extension, uh, five wins or less you're fired. Like you can't have three tiers there. I think it's gotta be two. I think it's gotta be one or the other for next season. The contract extension maybe is, is a different conversation, but I think you get, to a bowl game you coach your next year. I think that's fair. I think that's fair for Syracuse football. I think the thing I keep coming back to is this is an easy schedule this year. Mm -hmm. And I know we're going to get into a later pod, like predictions and stuff like that. But like when I look at this schedule, there are nine winnable games. Mm -hmm. The the only games that I'm like very hesitant to say are winnable at all is that three season stretch. I think everyone would expect of, or that three game stretch of Clemson, UNC, Florida state. Other than that, like every other game on this schedule feels winnable. And so I don't know how you can look at a schedule with nine winnable games and say that six wins is is the base. Like I think I, I'm not saying like you have to set the base at like a specific record, mm-hmm. but I do think you have to say it has to be a winning season. 
pre, that could pre be bowl it. game pre, pre bowl game. so uh, i was going to say does that include the bowl game? no i think it has you have to come pre out of the game. regular season with a winning record so six and six we're up for debate here yeah because the theory that i have is that wild hack will not fire dino mm-hmm. babers because wild hack doesn't fire coaches <laughs> so if they're in that iffy territory and maybe it is six wins mm-hmm. That could be in that world where they let Dino retire, Yeah, right? They let Dino just kind of step aside and we're moving on. You're moving on. Everybody's happy. They have mm-hmm. the, the, you know, the Jim Beheim like press conference. We're like, thanks for the memories, right? I mean, short of just a complete disaster, like a three or four win season, that's how they would move on. I actually think that's a fair compromise. So winning season is seven and five or above. Now, here's what I'll say about you're not wrong about the schedule. But I think we we have so much time to talk ourselves into this stuff in August. Yeah. Look, guys, bleep happens in football. <laughs> you have injuries, yeah. right? There's always one game where nothing goes right. Mm-hmm. There's always one game where you didn't see it come. Like you brought up that brutal stretch they're going to play. They're probably going to beat one of those teams just because football, right? Like Clemson's yeah. at home early in the schedule. There's They're going to stub their toe somewhere. The starting quarterback has not finished a season at Syracuse from start to finish since Ryan Nassib in 2012, right? So I get what you're saying about nine wins, nine wins, nine wins, but man, stuff happens, especially at Syracuse. So I think I think your winning season declaration is maybe where we got to draw that line. Mm-hmm. I think that's actually pretty fair. Yeah, I think too, just like looking, like I reread Chris Carlson's piece this morning that he did a couple weeks ago, looking at kind of the numbers around Dino's tenure here, he has a 36 and 49 record right now, which (laughs) I think something that's kind of like a red flag to me is that it would, even if Syracuse in some miracle was able to go 13 and 0, like let's leave the playoffs out of this, but we're like able to go 13 and 0 and, and got that 12 win regular season and their bowl win. Dino's overall record would still only be 0.500 in his career. Wow. Wow. Like (laughs) the numbers do work against them there two winning seasons in seven years that's a hell of a stat you just threw out there that even an undefeated 13 and 0 year gets you to 500 right but see here's another factor people like dino <laughs> yes. they like dino he for the most part there's exceptions to all rules runs a clean program we don't hear about a lot of them I and look quinn allen i mean that situation is as well documented by you and ann hayes on syracuse.com you can even poke a lot of holes in that but you just don't hear about football players publicly at the very least getting in trouble academically. They do pretty well. Mm-hmm. Like, and Dino is personable. Dino does all the things that, you know, an athletic department would on to do in terms of and not really with the media, frankly, but you know, people like Dino, he's a dude. He watches movies. He makes pop culture references like Emily, like Paul Pasquale back in the day, God bless the man. All he did was football. <laughs> Like you could drive by the football facility at two in the morning and you'd see a light on it. And there's Paul in there watching film like Dino. Like I can talk to Dino about Game of Thrones and things mm-hmm. like that. People like that. Yeah. Right now, again, the numbers and the uh, the likability factor, they're clashing here. So I think you found, you know, the the middle ground winning season. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's why like. A line I've kind of been dropping in these other like radio appearances and stuff as the season starts to ramp up is just like, I think from an an, in, an internal perspective, like both internal within like the athletic department and internal within like the fan base, Dino's seat has cooled from where we saw it last season. Mm-hmm. But from an outside perspective, from our perspective, from the national media perspective, from fans of other fan bases and stuff like that, I I think it's stayed the same in terms Mm -hmm. of the heat. And I think that goes back to the numbers versus culture kind of debate. Like, which do you weigh more heavily? Now, the transfer portal is the transfer portal. Okay. But let's transition to this. One thing that I think will be used to defend Dino coming back is not only what the current players think and like, and they like him like that. Mm -hmm. You get a sense of it talking to the players. I get a sense of it talking to the players. Like they like this coach and this staff. Mm -hmm. I have sensed no dissension there. Like they like this guy. Okay. But recruiting is ultimately going to come up in this conversation. There is a, there is a perspective, if you will, there is a narrative 
that this 2024 class is actually turning out to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. So let's examine that from the, as best as you can tell, all the obvious things to attach this conversation about recruiting. Would that be a, a tiebreaker to bring him back that he brought in this class and you could risk losing some great players if you do move on from Dino one way or the other? You know, I think I think certainly there's an argument to be made there. As of this morning, the class is number 47 in the nation, number 10 in the ACC per 247 sports. So that's the highest class Dino has had since 2018 when it was number 51 nationally. And that class included Trill Williams, Andre Sisko from this current team, Caleb Okachukwu. That was my graduating class. Oh, so there you go. that would have been oh, the year I was recruited. But um <laughs> You know, there there is certainly, an I think, an argument there that this could be a factor that weighs into whether he were to be extended or or held on to for the last year of his contract. But also, like, the transfer portal and JUCO additions, like, a lot of their additions this past year, like, they picked up a lot of JUCO guys that are expected to be contributors to this team maybe not first string, but second string and and kind of backup roles. And so like, even with a, a good recruiting class, like I think there's there's an argument to be made that like, well, how much of college football these days is high school recruiting and and coaches, coaches aren't ready to talk about that yet. Like they're not, they're not ready to talk about that, but that's where I see college football going in the future. Well, here, I think recruiting is a cop out too, because at some point, you're going to let down a recruiting class. Like, look at basketball, okay? Mm -hmm. At some point, Jim Beheim was going to tell a player, you're playing for me, and he didn't end up playing for him, right? Yeah. In football, it's the same thing. And you've got to think about, just to, to use a phrase you did a moment ago, to play devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. Maybe a new coach energizes recruiting. Mm -hmm. Maybe a new coach brings Syracuse from 10 to 6 yeah. in the ACC because they have a way to go about it that Dino and his staff did not. I think people get locked down by recruiting. They fear recruiting. And I get it that Syracuse fans feel this way because for the most part, recruiting has been a challenge mm -hmm. at Syracuse. So when you feel, and there is a perception that there's momentum and it's better, but man, short of like a five-star rock solid top player in the country type stud, you cannot be held down by recruiting. It's mm -hmm. a fluid process the transfer portal and some other factors out there have, I don't want to say made it less relevant, but it, it, you can recover quickly mm -hmm. with Dino or with a new coach. So recruiting cannot be to me the reason that Wild Hack is at a podium or Dino is at a podium saying, I'm going to coach this team next year. And because let's go to the most obvious thing, Emily, recruiting is, you could be a five-star player and fall on your face. Yeah. Right. It's such an unknown, no matter what the rankings say. Yeah. Well, and also like, like, I think it's always important at this point in the year when talking about recruiting to note that all of these kids have to actually go and sign. That's right. <laughs> That's we, right. We these are verbal what, commitments. Like yeah. we all know what happened last year, like two guys on early signing day with Lenora Sellers and then the other one whose name I can't remember right now, Vincent Carroll Jackson. There you go. Uh, it came to me. <laughs> they, they both flipped on decision day in December and they were two of the highest rated guys in this class. And even so far, just with verbal commitments, we saw Sire Torrance flip and, and go elsewhere. We saw Brendan Zerbrug, who is that other quarterback commit before Jakari Williams. He flipped and then flipped again, which is just <laughs> reminds you of See? the nature of verbal exactly. recruit, like it's verbal exactly commits. What we're talking about. And yep. so like, it's great that they have this momentum now. This momentum needs to carry all the way through getting those kids to sign and getting as many of them on campus early enrollees next January. All right. So whether Dino comes back or not and what next season looks like is dependent on the best players that this team puts forward <laughs> this season. So Emily and I are going to have a little fun. I have not seen her list. She has not seen mine. We just decided let's rank the five best players on this team. And I think you could phrase this a lot of ways. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say, I might've done it a little differently than like okay. flat out best, which we had talked about before. Mm -hmm. I approached my, my top five as like, obviously they're all good players, but players that Dino can't lose this season. I that, like that. That Syracuse can't lose. Cause there are plenty of good players on this team, yep. but I do think the list narrows when you start to think about, okay, if this person 
suffered a season ending injury in week one, like Stefan Thompson did last year or Rhino, which at, at ACC kickoff, like Aranda Gadsden said to me, he's like, I think our team would have been different if Rhino had been in the, in the season last year. So I approached it as like, if, if any of these guys were knocked out in week one, like who's going to be, how are they going to affect like the that. team? So that's the top five list. players, indispensable bless. Just the guys, you know, one of these goes down they're they're it's a big boo boo okay mm -hmm. we'll let you start right at the top number one you want to start with number one we're i was gonna, gonna go, start with number five we're gonna go one to five we're gonna start right at the top we're gonna start with the best we're gonna start with the okay best. okay you run the show that's you run right. the show that's right i'll trust you calling an audible emily we're gonna go one to five i i think it it has to be garrett schrader and it's just, I, I am so fascinated to see a fully healthy Garrett Schrader play this season. And that is just something that Syracuse has not seen in his two prior seasons here. Like we now know he was dealing with the elbow injury, especially in 2021. He dealt with the ankle stuff last year. And, you know, I'm higher on Carlos Del Rio Wilson as a backup than I think a lot of the fan base is. And that's just, he hasn't had the greatest showings in the spotlight, but on the practice field, I, I think he has shown a lot of improvement, but he's still not at a place where I think if, if Garrett was in like really injured early that he would be able to carry this team through an entire season this year. Like I think he just needs another year with Beck under his belt. So that's why Garrett's at the top of my list, I think is just because without him, like he is the linchpin of this offense there's no Sean Tucker to fall back on this year. Like Aranda, Aranda Gadsden will be on my list in one of these numbers, but like Aranda can't catch the ball if he doesn't have a good quarterback throwing to him. So fair. So but this is a chicken and egg <laughs> thing, Emily, and I'm putting Gats into the top of my list. Okay. <laughs> this is a dynamic talent. This is a guy who I think potentially could be the best wide receiver here since Marvin Harrison. I mm. think he's that good. And I think time after time last year, when this team needed a big play on offense, there was Gatson, right? Now, Schrader can overcome some issues on the offensive line, mm -hmm. obviously, because he's mobile, he's tough, he can hold the ball right to the last second. So I think it, there might be an offensive lineman on one of our lists here, but I think he overcomes that. I think you need Gatson on the field for the offense to operate at its best for two reasons. One, because he's that good. Two, if he's doubled, it opens up so many opportunities for so many talented receivers, right? And, and he's going to be doubled. <laughs> and he's going to be doubled, right? So I think you take him out of the equation. You have a good offense, not a great offense. I think he is that indispensable as a weapon. It's tough not to pick the quarterback at number one, but I think you take Gatson out of the mix. And, and a lot of things that Jason Beck wants to do, as much as this team has preached that everybody's getting the ball, kind of falls apart. Okay, this is already getting spicy because spicy. You, part of your argument for Aranda at one is why he is lower on my list. Oh, so, okay. um, so let's go to number two. Yeah, number two, most indispensable for me. I I went back and forth on a couple of people. I wanted an offensive lineman in this position just because I think the offensive line is this position group that has historically, from my understanding, had a lot of health and injury issues and if, if you don't have a healthy offensive line, like you potentially end up not having a healthy quarterback. You potentially end up not having a healthy running back because they protect all these other guys that the offense depends upon minus your wide outs and, and whatnot. Um, and so ultimately I went with Chris Bleich over Enrique Cruz was kind of like my, my backup guy I that think I those thought are the there. Two. Yep. Yeah. But I went with Chris because he he is the veteran of this group like he is the one that really has experience here at Syracuse and and under these schemes like obviously they have a new position coach but i just think you need someone in every position group that like has that that veteran experience and can rally the troops a little bit and also uh, looking at kind of like more stats based like Bleich has the best overall offensive grade and best overall pass blocking grade among the returning offensive linemen. So like he is, he is a good player. He has been a valuable player to them. Like I think he was third or fourth among all of Syracuse's linemen last year, but three of those other guys left. So he's like the top returner. And I think too, like he's another one of those guys that 
Syracuse hasn't seen healthy in right. his career here. Right. And if you you listen to his podcast, which I have a couple times now, um, he says he feels like he's 18 again. And Chris, that come he's on completely the pod. healthy. We'll, yeah. we'll do a cross pod thing. Come that on with great. us. That'd be fun. <laughs> So he says he's healthy again, too. And so it's like if he's already the best returning stats wise and he wasn't healthy last season, like he was only in 11 out of 13 games last year. If he's healthy, like what does that look like for the offensive line? Here's how this list is changing before our very eyes, because we changed the parameters of it. I like this better indispensable. So with that in mind, my number two is LaQuint Allen. <laughs> OK, He's not on my top five best players because I still have to see it. I think he's a talented kid. I think he had a great uh, pinstripe bowl, but I wouldn't put him on the best players on the team quite yet because I just got to see more. But if we're using the term indispensable, that running back room is so inexperienced and we don't know enough about it. And think about how, you know, when we were discussing at the height of the LaQuint Allen story, what it meant for him to be on this team versus what it meant for him not to be on this team. Let's just say people were freaking out. Okay. <laughs> That's true. They need him to lead the way. Now, other running backs are going to get on the field, but, and I don't want to put the pressure on LaQuinn Allen to do what Sean Tucker did, but what Sean Tucker did, put aside his talent and his numbers, Emily, he brought a consistency and a presence. You didn't have to worry about the running back position. For all the talk about the running back and the running backs aren't getting paid and this whole thing. This offense still needs a stable presence at that position. There's not enough guys in that room that have proven it. They're free to prove me wrong here. But mm -hmm. LaQuint Allen is just like, okay, we got a guy there. So if we're using indispensable, he shoots up to number two on my list. He, see, we're like opposing viewpoints right here. I, <laughs> I he, love it. I, he was like my my just out. Like he was like my number six. I, I think if we had recorded this like a month ago, I, I would have had him on it. But I think just what we've seen out of Juwan Price so far in camp, like he is looking pretty solid. And I think if something were to happen or, or had happened and Allen hadn't been able to return to the team, like I think Price would have been able to do most of the things that Allen's going to be able to do. Like it might have been a little bit more of a learning curve, but that's why you put four non – like non-conference games that are winnable at the beginning of your season. That's fair for, point. I like exactly that, though. I like yeah. that it's the Quint and Juwan. Mm -hmm. Putting all that on Juwan. I like Juwan. I've talked to him a couple times at camp, but I don't know. This just speaks to the whole position, Emily. Yeah. The whole position is still, like, when you put a cake in the oven, to use a Dino <laughs> expression, and it's in there for 45 minutes, the running back position is when you turn on the light and you check on it after, like, 30, it's, like, not ready. Yeah. Right? That's... That position is all okay. On to number three. Number three, I I cheated a little bit. I have a duo. I have a pair, and I I'm justifying this because Babers talked about them as a pair okay. in his his preseason I'll allow it. press conference. Um, he called these two the equalizers. Um, after some pushing to actually name players because he wasn't going are to you, at are first. You, are you gonna? <laughs> I am gonna, gonna say it? what you think. I'm are gonna you gonna say. do it? Brady Denberg and Jack Stone yeah! are two are two specialists for this season. The kickers. I just like I, I put them at number three. I I they obviously were not top two to me, but you know, like Syracuse is a team that plays a lot of close games. Sometimes you need you need a couple field goals to win close yes, games. You if you're if you're getting in and it's like 20 seconds left on the clock and you gotta make a game winning drive, like you need a kicker, like a good kicker. And so we haven't really seen Brady, Brady kick at all yet because we don't see the specialists in practice, really. But I, I think they need him. <laughs> I think they need Denneberg. It's a hell of a point because think of how comfortable you were the past few years with Andre Schmidt. Mm -hmm. Just didn't have to worry about it. Here he comes. Schmidt happens, yeah. as they say. The, it is inevitably going to come down to a field goal in a game at least and once at least once at least once and how many punters some people have said you know this is a, a sign that Syracuse football had to rise up here but I'm sorry they've cranked out a lot of good punters <laughs> in the last 10 years that show the value of flipping the field mm -hmm. right yes having that 47 yard 48 yard average mm -hmm. on punts well we didn't see that last year yeah right and special teams matters yes so yeah. that's not my number three I'm going to put Schrader at number three. Okay. Okay. I like what you said about Carlos Del Rio Wilson. I think a year better, a year wiser. If Garrett goes down, can he handle the load for two or three games? I think so. But you're not 
a seven or eight win team. You're not what you can be without mm-hmm. Garrett Schrader. I yeah. mean, I, I think he is that respected in that room. He's that talented, the relationship he's built, but the backup plays at Syracuse. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Car- we are going to see Carlos Del Rio Wilson He'll on come the field. In. <laughs> and I'm not talking about garbage time. He's going to play when it matters. So Schrader can't fall too far down the list. I'm going to put him there at three. Who do you got at number four? Number four, this was another one I kind of uh, waffled between a few guys. I wanted someone on on the defense to be in my Mm -hmm. list, uh, justifiably so. I ended up going Justin Barron because I think the D-line group is pretty solid. Like I considered Okachukwu, but the D-line group is pretty solid this year. They're not the question mark like they were last year. They're good. Linebackers, I think, are maybe the best position group as a whole on this team. Yep. Like, there's depth there. I trust that if three of them, God forbid, were like ended up being hurt, there's another three behind them that could come in and do relatively well. So I, I didn't pick Marlo Wax, even though I think he is certainly one of the best players on this team. Justin Barron, I went with because the defensive backs group is kind of the most in transition this mm-hmm. season. The safeties remain the same. It's Barron, Simmons, and Clark. But these cornerback positions, you lost Garrett Williams, you lost Deuce Chestnut. And I think, again, it it comes back to kind of what I said with Chris Bleich is that you need someone in there who can lead and can rally and has the veteran experience, and that's Barron. I think, too, he's also an integral part of the kicking game because he holds the ball. And we heard from Dino a little bit about that the other day about, like, Dino handpicked him to be Schmidt's holder last season because Schmidt apparently for a long time was like, oh, I don't want anyone besides the punter to hold the balls. And Dino was like, that's kind of insane, man. (laughs) Corrected him and was like, yeah, Baron can do it. So there's that. He has the second most returning tackles on the team. Like, I just think you need him out in that backfield, like roaming and and helping run that, that defense. My number four, you made a good point that that defensive line's pretty deep, but I'm still going to put Caleb Okachuku on this list because I think as much as he is a personality, as much as he is a leader, as much as I'm going to use the word here, presence, Mm -hmm. it's better on the field. Yeah, You need him on the field. If he gets hurt, God forbid, and can't play, like he can rally the sideline. He can do a lot of the things that Caleb does. I'm sure his podcast is coming back too. But I just feel like that's a guy you need on the field mm-hmm. to draw the attention of the offensive line. And I think it it kind of goes back to what we said about certain positions, like we talked about with a Ronde at the top. You're either good or you're great. I think with Caleb, they're great. I think without him, you start to downgrade a little bit here. So he's indispensable, not only on the field, but off. And I know he can give me everything he can off the field and the leadership he provides, but I think the total package has to be out there and I'm going to put him on the field. I'm going to do my five. Then I'm going to hand it over to you for number five. Okay. And I'm just going to steal what you just said. Cause you talked me into it with the kickers. <laughs> like that really, that really hit home yeah. when you said, like, Oh, that's right, man. <laughs> that's, that's like brand new. That's yeah. an important thing. So mm-hmm. I'm going to put them at number five. Well, and, and one more thing I wanted to say on that is you mentioned that Max von, von Marburg's like average wasn't great last year. It was 39.8 yards. And like, I think, Knowing Syracuse's depth problems and problems with attrition late in the season, like something that we were seeing is that the defense was on the field constantly, yes. which is why they got so worn down in the back half. And that's because like if the offense wasn't able to get things moving and were stuck back at their own one yard line, yeah. the ball was only making it to the 50 <laughs> and then the opponent only had to go 50 yards. It's or big difference. less than that to put points on the board. Well, so did yeah. Max get nominated for the Ray Guy Award? Yeah, or, I. Which those lists are there's like five. It's a watch people list. It's a preseason watch he list. Might not even be the punter. Yeah, I know. It's right? kind of crazy. I was like, okay, well, we'll see. It's it kind of there. crazy. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I'm sure he'll see some time in early games. I bet they'll switch him and Jack out a bit just because Jack is new and and who knows you you can hear things about a guy. You can see his tape then you can put him in a game scenario. I, I think he will handily win the battle, but um, yeah, yeah. I think they needed to be on this list. Don't you, Brent? <laughs> I, I totally, absolutely agree, and I'm glad you brought that up. And last but certainly not least, so, uh, you're number five. Number five for me was Aronde mm. because kind of in the vein of what you said about he's going to be double teamed and triple teamed this year, 
you argued that that would open up the field for the rest of the players. And so that makes him more indispensable. I, I think that makes him, him less indispensable mm. because it's going to force these other guys to step up. The guys like Damian Alford and Isaiah Jones and Trevor Pena. Um, and I think that is something that Syracuse needs because we heard Dino and even Garrett last year call for there to be a number two wide receiver behind Gadsden. And there never was like Alfred kind of emerged in the back half of the season, but like you look at the early season stats and everything is just going through Gadsden. <laughs> like there is, there is no one else really making these big time catches. Um, so I think it, there's going to be more of a by committee, like receiving pro approach just out of necessity, because it, it's going to happen just like it did with Sean Tucker last year, which Sean Tucker had a breakout 2021 season, as we all know, and 2022 came around and everyone was like, why isn't he doing well? <laughs> and it's like, because everyone knows he can, what he can do now, like teams just game plan for him better. And that's exactly what's going to happen with Gadsden. And I do have like, a little bit of hope for them and intrigue, I guess, around like the word we've heard tossed around for Beck's offense a lot is creative. Mm -hmm. And so like, if they are able to, to switch a lot of things up and kind of adjust on the fly to what other defenses are doing, then they'll probably get Gadsden open more and he'll still be able to do a lot of the things he was doing, even when he's double or even triple teamed. But I still think, that just knowing that teams are going to know about him, that makes this need for like multiple receivers, like more evident and I guess more present. I'm sure we missed a couple hit us on Twitter, hit us on email, let us know. But Emily, thank you for being our most frequent guest in the <laughs> young days of Syracuse sports. And I'm sure that will continue as we go along here. Thanks for having me, Brent. <laughs> oh, but wait, there's just one more thing, the John Wildhack equation. Syracuse Athletic Director John Wildhack doesn't fire people, and I don't think that he would fire Syracuse head coach Dino Babers no matter what happens in the 2023 season. Let's look at the track record. Jim Beheim. not that I expected Wildhack to fire Jim Beheim, but that didn't end well. There was that clunky Wednesday press conference, remember at the ACC tournament where Jim Beheim was kind of the shoulder shrug emoji guy, I don't know what's going on. And then there was the nice, nice Friday press conference where everybody kissed and made up. Still, pretty clunky ending. John Desco retired as the head men's lacrosse coach here at Syracuse, despite saying in 2021 that he fully intended to return in 2022 to lead that team after they lost in the NCAA tournament to Georgetown. Quinn Hillsman resigned. He was not fired as the women's basketball head coach after serious revelations about a bullying culture were made in a story published first in The Athletic. Football is supposedly different. It drives the bus and all those cliches that you and I have heard about how it leads the way in college sports. So if you apply that to Babers, he needs to get to a bowl game or have a winning record to stay at the controls, as Emily and I discussed. But if he doesn't, here's what I think will happen. Dino Babers will retire. Wild Hack won't have to fire him. They can have the nice, nice press conference where Babers can crack jokes one last time and show off what kept him here longer than maybe most coaches would be. You know, I like the idea of a coach being here for a long time. It's old school. If Babers does have a winning record this season, that would bring him back for nearly a decade. Ben Schwartzwalder was here for 24 years. Dick McPherson was the head coach of Syracuse football for nearly a decade. Paul Pasqualoni for over a decade. But what we have here, especially in the cutthroat environment of 2023, is the ultimate contrast of numbers versus feelings. Everybody likes Dino Babers and would like to see him stay on as the head coach. But the numbers scream out something different, particularly these two winning seasons in seven years and a record of 36 and 49 overall, which as Emily Liker pointed out, he would have to go 13 and 0 this season just to get to 500 as a head coach. Not a good look for somebody in their eighth season. No matter what that recruiting class is in 2024, it cannot be the determining factor of bringing back Babers in 2024. Merely one ingredient in the recipe if it comes down to, well, six and six, maybe he should, maybe he shouldn't. The winning rec 
record, as Emily and I went over, is the compromise. It does feel like this has come to a head. Now, I've had one source tell me that seven and five or more for Babers equals an extension. Six and six, even with a bowl game, equals no extension, but you can come back and coach in 2024, and a losing record means it's time to move on. You have to eliminate the middle part from that. This is all or nothing. This is winning season or not for Dino Babers. No pressure or anything there, Dino. But we do know this. No matter what, John Wildhack will give you a soft landing. That's episode two of Syracuse Sports with Brent Axe. Please subscribe on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're doing that, please leave us a review. It really helps us stand out in a crowded podcast field, and we really appreciate it. Want to leave us a voicemail anytime? Cannot wait to hear from you guys there. 315-552-1964 is the number. Thanks to Emily Liker for being our guest today. Thanks to Nate Mink, Scott Schild, Lauren Long, and Krista Lemzak for their technical assistance. And we thank you for watching and listening to episode two of Syracuse Sports with Brent Axe. We'll talk to you next time.